Well, good morning. Boy, what a blessing to see all of you today. Let's stand and sing, All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Let's sing the first, second, and the last. All hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him. and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed, ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him. And crown him, Lord. Uh, oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him, Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. Blessed be the name of the Lord. All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme. All praise. Let me see. Let's not sing the same song with different words, all right? On the first... <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> All praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. And the last verse, his name shall be Counselor. His name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace of all earth's kingdoms conqueror whose reign shall never cease blessed be the name blessed be the name blessed be the name of the lord blessed be the name blessed be the name blessed be the name of the Let's sing that chorus one more time. Blessed be the name. Ready? Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Are you glad to be in God's house this morning? Say amen. 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 I tell you what, we just need to pray for our nation right now. It's in a mess. Uh, downtown San Antonio did have some a little bit of rioting last night. And the Servicemen Center, uh, which is downtown there, uh, had some, uh, it's a ministry, had some broken windows. So thankfully, there was nothing looted. That's what I understand. Nothing stolen. <laughs> but, uh, and they need more of that, a lot more of the Bibles. Uh, but uh, we need to be praying for our cities. Uh, we don't have a virus problem. We have a sin problem Amen. in our nation. And uh, there is only one race, the human race. That's it. God said of all nations are one blood. That's what God said. 
and racism was invented by Charles Darwin. That's the biblical worldview, okay, versus the cultural worldview. Now, how you take that side, you can side with the Lord or you can side with the world on how they view things. But there's only one race, and that's the human race. I despise when I'm asked what race I am on a sheet. I want to say human. That's what I am, and that's what we are. And we're not individual races. That's, that's a cultural concept. That's all that is. But it's not a biblical concept, okay? And we'll be talking a little bit about that this morning, not very much. We're going to talk mostly about God and who he is, amen? And that helps us get the right viewpoint on things. Well, let's pray, and then we'll continue on with our services this morning, amen? Brother Wesley, will you pray? Sweet is the song, Sweet is the song I'm, singing today. I'm singing today, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. I'm redeemed. Trouble, and sorrow trouble and sorrow have vanished away. Kneel at the cross. Ready? Kneel at the cross. Christ will meet you there. Come while he waits for you. Listen to his voice. Leave with him your care and begin life on you. Kneel at the cross. Live every care. Kneel at 
the cross, Jesus will meet you there. Kneel at the cross, there is room for all who would his glory share. Bliss there await, harm can ne'er befall those who are anchored there. Kneel at the cross. unto realms above turn not away to life's sparkling cup trust only in his love kneel at the cross stand now and let's sing the next time he comes. <clears throat> Brother Matt will be talking a little bit about that in the message. From the lofty courts of heaven came a bond on earth to bloom, knowing when he left his father that his fate would be the tomb. But the grave, it could not hold him. Angels rolled the stone away. Now the mighty rose of Sharon is still blooming yet today. And the next time he comes, he won't have to die for me. The next time he comes, there won't be a Calvary. Next time he comes, we'll begin eternity. And when he comes again, he'll be coming for me. I remember when I met him, how the Spirit took control. He established my going, now he stars in my last roll. For a man to come from heaven, knowing then of Calvary, oh, what love beyond all measure that he gave his life for me. But the next time he comes, he won't have to die for me. The next time he comes, there won't be a Calvary. And the next time he comes, we'll begin eternity. And when he comes again, he'll be coming for me. Let's sing that chorus one more time. But the next time he comes, he won't have to die for me. The next time he comes, there won't be a Calvary. And the next time he comes, we'll begin eternity. And when he comes again, he'll be coming for me. Amen. Don't you look forward to the second coming of Christ? Amen. Amen. The cry of man today is for justice, but true justice will never be sought here on this planet. He desires a kingdom that only God can give. Let that sink into your heart this morning. The cry of man is for a kingdom that only God can give. That's why his soul cries out. That's why there's rioting in the streets. It's for justice. And only God can give true justice. That justice will never be found on this planet. We'll be studying a little bit about that this morning. Amen? You may be seated. Let me say a couple of things about Faith Bible Institute. Tonight we'll be having a graduation ceremony for uh, our graduates. Um, we'll also be recognizing a high school graduate. 
Last time I checked, they didn't get to go through a lot of the stuff that we went through. Uh, but uh, we'll be having our Faith Bible Institute elective, Biblical Worldview Number 1. And that'll begin uh, June the 21st. The deadline for enrolling without paying a $24 extra late fee is today. So if you've got that form, you'd like to give it to me uh, with the check and so forth. Uh, there are brochures in the back. I've got one right here. And then let me mention also that uh, it's not too late to enroll for this fall semester of Faith Bible Institute. If you have not enrolled previously, it's not too late to enroll without having to pay a late fee. Uh, and that's a, that's a great class, a great course. Uh, I, hope you, I hope you'll get involved, all right? And then tonight, don't forget for the graduation ceremony, uh, it's, a, it's a great time. We'll also have an opportunity to recognize uh, Lily, who graduated from Judson this year, all right? Come ahead, Brother Bob. Isaiah 52, 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigneth. Our God reigns. Boy, that couldn't have been a more perfect song 
for my message. I'm telling you what, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> Man, God is reigning, folks. And this fear that is taking hold of our country is straight from the devil. Folks, we got to wake up. Wake up. This fear is not from God. The Bible says that he has not given us a spirit of fear, no matter what the context is. Race or virus, it makes no difference. The fear does not come from God. The only one who wants us to kill ourselves and each other is the devil. And that is a fact. Let's turn to the book of Joel, chapter number 2, this morning. Joel, chapter number 2. God has led me to do a series of messages on the character of God. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to discuss God's character because we as Christians need to remember who God is. Current, present, in the midst of this mess. We are watching our democracy unravel before us, folks. You don't think this is serious. This is extremely serious. It will produce a, the next civil war if things do not stop. And the only one who would have us kill ourselves is the devil. Period. This country is in need of prayer like she's never been before. Joel chapter number 2, verse number 25, we're going to read these verses, verse 25 through 32. The Bible says, and I, this is God speaking, I will restore to you the years the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else. My people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, and blood and fire, and the pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Hallelujah. For in the Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. Father God, we come to you this morning, and we praise you, first of all, that you reign, that you're in control, and that we are watching man's kingdom fall apart. This down here on this earth is man's kingdom, but God, you have a kingdom, and you sit on a throne this morning, that is not of man, it's of God. And I pray this morning that we'll be reminded that God is in charge and he is in control and that you are the God of restoration. I pray this morning that you will do a powerful working in this service and that you will anoint me fresh and new in the powerful name of Jesus, we pray, amen. It's very important as we look at the book of Joel to understand a little bit about this book. First off, there is some debate on who or when Joel prophesied. They're not really sure if it was a later, some that say it was later, some say it was earlier. However, after some study on my own, seeing particular scriptures in Joel lends me to think it was one of the earliest of the minor prophets, putting him around the time of the end of Elijah's life, the prophet Elijah, and the beginning of Elisha's life, all right? And the reason that I'm not going to be dogmatic on that is because it really doesn't matter. <laughs> Are you with me? The fact is that God still wrote it. It's still true. 
and that prophecy from this book has been fulfilled. Here are some things in this book that are very important. There are some days that are mentioned, especially in this book, the day of the Lord, or what we would say the day of Jehovah. When you see that in your Bible, when you see the word capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's specifically speaking to Jehovah. The day of Jehovah is a specific day. But I want us to look at the different days of, 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 uh, that are mentioned in the Bible. The first one that you see on the screen is the day of man. Paul speaks as man's day. The day here spoken of, this is found in 1 Corinthians 4, 3. The day here spoken of it as which we live. When man has sway and governs on the earth. This is the day and era in which we live in right now. To represent this rule, God gave King Nebuchadnezzar the dream of the image of a man. Interesting that God used a man to show that man, this is your kingdom. This is what you will do. But do not forget, we just got through studying the book of Daniel, and we studied how King Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. He had the head of gold, the chest of silver, the waist of bronze, and the legs of iron, and the feet of clay and iron. And the Bible says in those that there's going to be a rock cut out without hands that will come and destroy man's kingdom. That rock is Jesus Christ. He's going to destroy all of man's kingdoms because man is unjust. And man does not know how to seek proper justice or peace. And God will come and he will destroy man's kingdoms and set up his own kingdom. And that's God's kingdom. And, and so just remember as you fight for one side or the other whose kingdom you're fighting for. All right? Is it the souls of men or is it the skin color? And that's a, good, that's a good question to ask. You have man's day, and you have the day of, of Jesus Christ. Now, this day of Christ is the very next thing that we as a church look for. This is the rapture. Is This is found in Philippians 1, 6, the day of Christ, which will come. And this is the next thing on the prophetic calendar for us, folks. Prophecy is not being fulfilled every day. I'm going to repeat that again. Prophecy is not being fulfilled every day. The very next thing that God will do is come for his bride, come for his church. That's the born again, the folks who believe in Jesus Christ. That is the very next thing on God's calendar. God's not waiting for one more prophecy to be fulfilled before he comes back. And so this is very important information. Why? Because the very next thing that God's going to do is come for you and me. And those who are without Christ will be left here for the day of the Lord, which the book of Joel speaks of. That's where you are hearing these words where the sun will be blackened and the moon will be turned to blood. That's the very words of Joel yet to be fulfilled. And this is very important for us to understand. The day of Christ is when we are raptured out of this place and the day of Jehovah begins on that day. It comprises the time of the great tribulation. This is the 70th week of Daniel that's spoken of in Daniel 9, 27. And the time and the rule of the Messiah of Israel will come to pass, and they, he will be in Jerusalem on the throne of David. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God's going to come down from heaven. He's going to set up his throne right here on this earth, and he's going to say, I am king. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I tell you what, the more of the mess I see out here in this world, whether it's a virus or, or riots, I, the more I look for his kingdom to come. Amen. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. Amen. I'm ready for the kingdom of Christ to come. I'm ready for every knee, every knee to bow and to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of all the earth. I'm ready for that day to come. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Now, the day of Jehovah begins the tribulation, but you have one more day. You have the day of God, and this gets serious, folks. 
Immediately following the day of Jehovah in that seven year of tribulation comes the day of God. In that day, the elements, the earth and all the universe will melt with a fervent heat and a new heaven and a new earth will result. Again, what kingdom are you fighting for? These are good questions to ask, is it not? You see, in this book, these last days throughout eternity, God will be all in all. And in the book of Joel, we have purposely elaborated on these things, these vital days, because the theme of the prophecy of Joel is the day of Jehovah, the day of the Lord, that great tribulation. With this truth in mind, we can readily discern how the locust plague mentioned in verse 25 that we just read serves as a foreshadowing of the coming day of the Lord. And I say to you this morning, what we are seeing in our nation is only a foreshadowing of what the tribulation will be like. That is why the church needs to be on her knees crying out for her country. Divided we will fall. We will be our own demise. The greatest nation on the earth will be nothing but a byword. United we stand. This Joel character, this person, his name means Jehovah is God. Well, that's a good name to name a son, amen? Joel. Jehovah is God. His name, Jehovah is God, literally means I am that I am. I am present with you. I am, he is the I am of your circumstances. If I, I will be your God, God says, and ye shall be my people. Listen to this. God is present in your circumstances. God is present in your trial. God is present in your chaos. Listen to this. He, his presence is bigger than your circumstances. If you dismiss his presence, you are only left with your circumstances. That's what we have going on in our country right now. This dismissal of God. And what comes after the dismissal of God? Chaos, riots, fighting, killing. This isn't a mark of a cultural thing. This is simply a mark of paganism in our country. It's taken root it's heathenism is without a God. God, help us, folks. We've got to get serious. We've got to get serious about who God is. We've got to get serious about the God of the Bible. And we've got to side with God and not with things that come up in our lives, not with what, what's going on, what's the latest and the greatest. None of those things matter. What we need to do is we need to focus on who God is. He's king. He reigns. And only he can heal the hurt that's going on right now in our hearts and in our country. Why? Why do you say that, Pastor Matt? Look at verse 25. What does God say? I will what? Who said these words? Who said them? Let me ask you a question. Do you believe God can? Do you believe that? I'm going to tell you what, if I didn't believe this, you know what I'd do? I'd shut my Bible and I'd go home and I would never read that thing and I'd never pray to that God. Why? Because if he can't restore us, we are in a heap of a mess, folks. We need God. We need God. We need to wake up because God is alive, he's real, and we are in a battle. And it's not a battle for a skin color. It is a battle for the souls of man. God needs us to unite together and to love one another. The Bible says that hatred stirreth strife, but love covereth a multitude of sins. Amen. That's what God says. You've got to get your focus back on the Bible and back on the book and back on who God is and off of the news, amen. The news is the counsel of the heathen. 
And God never told us to listen to the heathen. The Bible says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. We've got to get back to the book, folks. Get back to the book. God says, I will restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. This word restore means to repay, to reward. The Hebrew root word is the absence of strife. It means peace. It actually comes from the root word shalom. And do you think it's any coincidence that God named his city here on this planet Jerusalem? Jerusalem. I'd say right now that it's anything but peace, wouldn't you? But there will come a day when he sets up his throne right there in Israel. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. God says, I will restore to you what the locusts have eaten. Now, that's pretty powerful that God would restore something that's been taken or stolen. But God also says, not only will I restore what they've eaten, but I will restore to you the time that's stolen. Look at the verse with me again. Verse 25. I will restore to you the what? The what? The years. God says, I'll restore the time. Now, hold on a minute. I understand that maybe God could restore to you maybe wealth or things that got stolen, goods and things. But how in the world is God going to restore time? How? How does God restore years that have been stolen away from you? Let me tell you this morning that God can and God will. But I'm not going to stop with that. I'm going to give you an explanation of what I think. Truly, only God can restore what the, the locusts have eaten. True healing will take place in your life when you and I realize that God can take any hurtful or painful moment in our life and use it for his glory. That's part of the way that God takes and gives you back the years that have been stolen from you. Let me explain it like this. There's a, there's a video out that I, I highly, highly suggest that you watch. And I, as far as I know, it was still on YouTube. It might be taken off. But it was, it, it's called, and such for some of you. And what it is, it's, it is personal testimonies of people who were in homosexuality for 10 to 15 years and got saved and came out of that life. And one of them, this is his testimony. This is how he describes what God did in his life. He says, literally, God showed me, and I realized that God could take every hurtful moment, no matter when it took place in my life, and God is outside of time, and he could go to that very moment when that hurt, when that pain took place, and God can literally touch that moment in my life and heal that moment in my life that happened to me. God is outside of time. And if you will turn your life over to him, he can take every moment in your life. And that moment, which needs the most work, God can come outside of you at the time of your life. And he can go back to that moment in your life when you face that hurt or that pain or that suffering. And he can touch it and he can restore it. And that is one of the ways that God takes all things in your life and makes them good. You say, how does he do that? He's supernatural. He's almighty God. He reigns and he is kingdom. He is king over this earth and he is king over all the universe and everything. And we've got to realize who this God is. In Hebrews 12, 11, it says, now no chastening for the present seemeth joyous to us, right? I mean, none of us love to be chastened. That means corrected. And most of the time it's grievous. We're sorry that it happened. Nevertheless, the Bible says, afterward it yieldeth a peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. If you'll just listen to God in the moment of chastisement, in the moment of trial, in the moment of great uh, strife, God says afterwards it will yield a peaceable fruit of righteousness. But if you turn his... But if you turn him away and you turn away his truth and you turn away what he wants to do in your life, you're only left 
with the pain and the suffering. And that's why people turn to drugs. That's why people turn to alcohol. That's why we have a pandemic, an opioid pandemic in our country. That's why we have all the things that go through and why are we having riots and things because we have a sin problem because we know that in our soul things are not right and so we are trying to correct them ourselves instead of looking to the Lord. You know what, by, you know what God says? Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Look at verse 26. And ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. This is what God says. After this restoration, I'm going to give you so much that you can't eat it all and you can be satisfied. You know, I know that God is partly Baptist or at least maybe he's all Baptist because when we get to heaven, you know what he's going to do? He is going to have a marriage supper of the lamb. He loves to eat and so do I. Amen. Can you tell? Yeah. Yeah, man, I like food, good old brisket, amen. We'll probably have some of that in heaven. Maybe Brother Isidore will have his brisket smoker back there somewhere. Hallelujah. Glory. God loves to eat. God, God loves that feast. God loves to have that time of rejoicing. He wants you and I to rejoice with him. The Bible says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. God wants you to taste him. He wants you to know what he tastes like. God wants you to know exactly how he feels in your life. He feels like peace. He feels like joy. He feels like an overwhelming sense of calm. In John 7, 38, God says this, He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow, flow rivers of living water. You see, when people feed off of your life, they shouldn't come up with more hate and more strife. They should come up with more joy and more peace. You know why? Because you are a living well, a well of goodness, a well of life. You don't have a tongue that cuts like a sword. Instead, you got a life-giving tongue. The Bible says that he that winneth souls is wise that's giving life instead of taking life in fact John 10.10 10 says the thief cometh not but for to steal steal Kill and destroy. Think about that one for a second. Isn't that, isn't that what we're seeing? Stealing, killing, destroying? The thief. Who's the thief? Who's God talking about? Come on now. Satan. That's a little more serious, isn't it? I certainly don't want to be working for him. I don't want to be a part of the thief's crowd. I don't want to be a part of the Satan's crowd. I am come, Jesus said, that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Not just life, abundant life. Are you feasting on his presence? Are you feasting on the living well? Are you feasting on joy, peace? Now let's look at verse 28. And it came to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit. Again, this is still God speaking. And let me tell you something. God didn't say in these verses, and you can go back and read it for yourself some other time. But God doesn't say, well, if you do this, then I'll do that. And if you do this, I'll do that. Basically, God's saying, this is going to happen whether you like it or not. And when God says something like that, you can just take it to the bank because it is going to happen. And guess what? In verse number 28, it's a direct fulfillment of prophecy. Look with me again. And it came to pass that afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Now, doesn't that sound kind of familiar? Does it sound a little bit familiar? Or maybe you're like, well, I don't know if that sounds familiar or not, Pastor Matt. I'm not, not all that familiar with the Bible. Well, let me help you out. Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost. You know what's interesting? You know what today is? 
today is Pentecost Sunday. It's the day the church was born. On that day, on Pentecost, Peter said this, but this is the day which was spoken to you by prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams and on and on my servants and on my handmaids, I will pour out my spirit in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. This prophecy was fulfilled 700 years later. Joel chapter 2 verse number 28 is fulfilled 700 years later. Why? Because God is outside of time. Because God is outside of space. And because God always keeps his promises. Time is no, not a problem with God. God does not have an issue with time. And I find it interesting that actually what God did was he led me to verse number 25. That was the verse that God put on my heart this week. But as I began to study, I found verse number 28 as I was studying. And then after I studied the message and I had everything together, I was reading some, uh, some articles by Franklin Graham and some others. And I was looking up some things and, and, I found out that today marks Pentecost Sunday. And I thought, now I know that for sure God wants me to preach this message. What's the likelihood that I would choose of all the verses, be led of the Lord to preach on Joel 2.25 and then find out that it is the exact verse quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost. God is outside of time. God is outside of space. God is always in control. And verse number 30 goes on. He says, and I will show wonders in heavens. By the way, Peter went ahead and quoted all this as well. In Acts 2, 16, he quoted it all. He said, and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before that great and terrible day. This is verse 30 and verse 31 of Joel chapter 2. You see, this is a continuation of the prophecy that is yet to come. This did not take place on the day of Pentecost. This is a continuation of the prophecy to come. This prophecy foretells future events that have not taken place. How do you know that, Pastor Matt? Because of Revelation 6, verse 12. It says this, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as the sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So Revelation 6.12 teaches us that Joel was got it right and that God agrees with himself. Even though it was over 700 years later, God's scriptures correlate with one another and there is no problem with reconciling Joel 2.28 and Revelation 6.12. These are the things to come. But I love this last verse of Joel 2, 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in the Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And as the Lord has said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. You know what's interesting about that verse right there? Is it doesn't really matter if it was Old Testament, New Testament, church, or the tribulation, if you call on the name of the Lord, he gives deliverance. God has provided a recipe for every single age and time. All you need to do is call on me. It doesn't matter what time or era that you are in. All you got to do is call on me. God has the recipe. God wants to deliver. And all we need to do is focus on him. God will deliver if we pray. God will do the restoration if we seek him. And we desire to do that, don't we, folks?
I don't think you would have come this morning if you were seeking something else. If you were looking for something else, looking for a, a, a guy up here to jump around and shout and get excited, then I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry I disappoint. I hope you came just to look to him, to look to God. Who is God? He's the God of the restoration. He's the God who restores. You say, well, what about in my life? There's somebody who I want to be restored to who I know they could be. You pray to the God of restoration. You say, but that was stolen from me. I feel like years were wasted. I feel like things were taken from me that I did not want to happen. Then you pray to the God of restoration. You say, how? How do I know he will do it? Because he said in verse 25, I will restore. And this is based on his character of who he is. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your working. And I pray even this morning that you'll do a marvelous work, that you will work in people's hearts, that you will help them to come to the conclusion that you're the God of the restoration. Lord, I believe with all my heart that what you'd rather see in America is a great revival. Lord, help the church to rise up in this moment and help her to seek you. Oh, God, I pray this morning that your presence will be so near and real to us this morning that you will do a marvelous work this morning, a powerful working, and that you will do as you said, I will restore. And we're praying this to be done in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed.